So, um, as I've been introduced, my name is Sally Hardy. I work at London South Bank University. My career as a nurse, um, I say to my students, I trained in the 1800s when <laughs> nurses were very much do as you're told um, practitioners. And I have undertaken lots of education myself, but I have always kept the mantra that I need to work where I can make a difference. And that is something that I picked up from when I trained as a general nurse in London. I did four weeks on a psychiatric placement. And I walked into this unit and it reeked of smoke. And there were people and bodies everywhere. And I was frightened. I was absolutely petrified. So I spent the first two days hiding in the office not quite knowing what to do with myself, how to behave, what to say in case I triggered some disaster. But I was told to be yourself, be true to who you are. And I think that picks up beautifully what um, the previous speaker has told us about honesty, integrity, the fairness, the authenticity of being you whether you are an educator, a researcher, a practitioner, a student, a learner, wherever you are, there's the potential to learn. And I have also learned that when you do that work well, you do change people's lives. So my talk today is about getting research into practice. I think it follows on beautifully from Doris's beautiful talk. And for me, research into practice is the melding and the blending, the coming together of a workplace culture of learning and a scientific inquiry, curiosity, a thirst for new learning. And when you get that right, magic happens. So it's about sharing knowledge, improving people's lives, but it's also about good use of resources. When you do research well, you actually use the resources very efficiently. And it's about informing that workplace culture, allowing people to think and to sometimes behave and think differently in what they're doing. So huge, huge possibilities. So I'm going to draw from some experiences of my work, both in England, in Australia, across very different workplace contexts. But what I've found is keeping those fundamental values at the forefront of your conversations and your behaviours can really begin to make a change. So, I'm going to talk about where to start. Where do you start when you're thinking about research in the messy lowlands of clinical practice? Who to include, so it follows on some, from some of the questions that were already being initiated from our first talk. What to do, because like I say, walking into a new environment can be incredibly scary. Not just for you as the researcher, but also for your participants. How to go about doing that practitioner-driven research. Thinking about what might happen, what the consequences and the impact of that activity is. And of course, as I say to all of my research students, why bother? Why bother with doing this research? So lots to think about. And hopefully lots of overlap. And here's one already, the traffic lights. <laughs> so what I'm suggesting here is that life can be confusing, research can be incredibly confusing, and clinical practice is always throwing up new challenges and can be incredibly confusing. So how do you blend all of those things together and know which is the clear path to take? So the green light is, okay, we've got a good idea, let's see if we can get going with this. Hang on a minute. There's more to think about. What is the purpose of your research? Why are you doing this research? For whose benefit? Why bother? 
So have you got a clear purpose for undertaking your research? And again, I always say to my students, what's your question? What do you want to know? What do you want to understand? So then the amber light or the orange light is stop a minute, pause a minute, and be reflective about what you're doing and why. What's already known in the area that you're looking at? Has this landscape been surveyed and dug before? What does it mean to me to be going into this environment? What are my values, prejudices, biases that I take in to that environment as a researcher? What can I draw from for my clinical knowledge to understand? When is the best time to try and engage someone with dementia into a conversation about the care that they're receiving? Do I go in first thing in the morning when the ward is at its busiest or do I try and find some time later in the day but is then my, the person I want to talk to too tired and their confusion is even more illicit. So thinking about the context, being constantly critically reflective about what you're doing and why. Again, as Doris picked up, invariably doing clinical or practice driven research there is a political agenda as well, in terms of where you're going, why you're going there, and you need to understand the political landscape as well. And that is also about that intent, that honesty, the fairness, the authenticity. Why and who am I to be going into this environment to do this research? So some of the work that I did in Australia, I was asked to visit those wards and clinical areas that had very high mortality rates, a lot of staff were leaving, some of them had had really serious incidents that had caused an ongoing tsunami of anxiety, confusion, concern, stress, and that was beginning to show in how practitioners were engaging functioning in their roles. So context is a red light. You need to know where you're going, what the political landscape is and what you're heading into. Because otherwise you will be spending two days in the office with your head in your hands thinking, oh my goodness, what have I come into? How on earth can I make a difference in this environment? And then one of the things I've learned over the years is you have to engage your commissioners, those that are funding, sponsoring, or wanting this research to take part. Why do they want you in there? What is it they want to address? And are they willing and able to support you when you start to unravel things that perhaps they don't want to know about? So when you've got all that right, then we're back on the green light then we know how to move forward. We've got a bit of a plan. So then who to include? I like to work in a collaborative, collegial, co-productive approach. And that means I have to think carefully about who my stakeholders are. So stakeholders are literally people with a stake or an interest in what you're going to be doing or in the organisation or the area or the country within which you're working. How are they representing? What are they representing? And who are they representing? So as Hazel said in the introduction, I work a lot with patients, service users, clients. I like to call them people. I work with people who have been through sometimes highly traumatic experiences, whether that's from their health, from their workplace context. We know that the NHS in England is under-resourced and staff are overworked, underpaid. I'm getting political now. So I have to walk carefully alongside people to allow them to understand me and what my agenda is as well as to understand their workplace context. Some of the organisations, again, that I go to, I spend some time just observing. 
just looking at what's going on, listening to how people talk to each other. So I hope, Doris, as a social scientist, you will see that some of us have ethics and moral codes. <laughs> So I work with people as equal partners. I'm not going in as the one who knows. I'm not going in as the person who's got all the answers. I want to work in the environment alongside people because I believe everyone has a contribution and everyone can make a difference when they are given the opportunity to do so. And again, as we've seen, everybody has a story to tell. What I often have to find as well is who are the gatekeepers? Who are the people that can allow me to get into where I need to get into? So working with children who have been severely abused, they're not necessarily the people that will volunteer to come and work with you on a project about um, nursing interventions in acute psychiatric settings. They are probably those people that never want to see the inside of the psychiatric building ever again. So how do you access, how do you get alongside that sort of vulnerable population? One of the things I also make sure that I have when I'm undertaking practice-driven research is critical friends, people who can look from the outside and say, have you thought about this? You're, you seem to be veering down this direction. What about what's happening over here? So continually having that critical eye, someone that can put you back on the right track in case you get seduced or taken down an avenue that actually may not be beneficial for the project, for the, the stakeholders, etc., etc. And one of the ways then to bring all of these disparate groups of people together is to ensure that you have a steering group, a group that can literally steer the project, a group that you can go back to and plug your phone into and get recharged to go back out there to do more data gathering, etc, etc. So the overall aim, I would say, of practice-driven research is to broaden and widen your group of participants. So then you've got everyone together, you're on your green lights, you've got your team, you've got critical friends, you've got access, you've got a clear purpose, now what do you do? So one of the words that I've come across and I've played with as a, a mnemonic is praxis. Praxis means critically informed action, but for me it means purpose, having a clear purpose. Reflexivity, continually thinking again, what am I doing, how am I going to do this, what's the impact, what's the consequences, what do I need to know? Approaches, we had a question earlier, can you only use qualitative methods when you're doing this intensive participatory co-production work? I would say no, I am more a mixed methods advocate. It depends what you want to find out, who you want to find it out from, how you're going to access them, what's already known. And then you begin again to blend and meld your approach. It's suitable to the situation you're going into. What I hadn't thought about, again Doris challenged my thinking, if you're doing a survey, you've already set the question, so are you already going in with a layer of stigma? So I would argue, okay then, we co-produce those questions that you use for your survey. So I would get the nursing team or I would get the multidisciplinary team thinking through, using that reflexive cycle, what is it they want to know, what are the questions, what do we know, what's our baseline, how would we like to see this moving forward. Again, we've already talked about consent to participate and I am an advocate for what we call in the business process consent. So I wouldn't go and gather consent from my participants just at the beginning of the research. Every time we have a conversation, I would open up the notion of consent to 
continue to participate? Can we use this? How do you feel if we represent this this way? How would you like to see your story told and retold? Because when I write up someone else's story, I am already putting my words often. So I have to constantly go back and make sure that I've captured their authentic voice. And you asked the question about time. And again, with clinical busy teams, they tell me, I haven't got time to do this. There's no way we've got time to have an action research meeting once a month for a whole hour. There's no way that's going to happen. Then you have to start challenging the workplace culture. You have to reiterate the agreed purpose as to why you're there and begin to allow people to understand that they are contributing and what they will benefit from getting involved in the research. And then suddenly, the action learning is where they plug their phone in. They feel so much better from just having an hour out of their busy schedules to think about what they're doing, to know that they're engaging in research that's going to make a difference in their work. Um, thank you for this insight to practice driven research. My name is Melanie Hai and I'm not a scientist. I'm coming from an initiative that wants to give parents a voice and what do we need in maternal care and in birth. And what we find is when we try to talk to scientists or politicians, there are many that take us serious and there are just as many who don't take us serious at all. Now I listened to you how you talked about what's the purpose of research and what should be research. And of course, as a parent, we have our thoughts. And what is your recommendation, what is your advice? How, as a non-scientist, can you be heard? Okay. When you were asking the question, I immediately had that phrase, the gatekeepers. Who are your critical friends in the maternity environment? Have you got some key stakeholders in your locality, in your organisation that have already got a level of um, authority or contacts with politicians or the funding, potential for funders, and you start to build those relationships. And once you get a few of your critical friends on board, then you might be able to extend your circle of so you have to be quite strategic. Um, I've, I've written so many, I think, super duper research proposals, spent hours honing them to just be rejected at the first hurdle. And it's crushing. But you need to know what is expected of the project, what the funders are looking for, and begin to answer those questions, and then you can weave in the other things that you can actually get done. So you have to be strategic in how you get that voice heard initially until you get the momentum. And then, as Doris said, you know, the lady on the panel who everyone remembers wasn't the chairman, the politician, it was the authentic voice. When it does get allowed to be heard, it is absolutely powerful. So don't give up. Thank you. Thanks. One more question or comment? Thank you. My question, thank you for the practice research uh, talk. What I'd like to know is how did you get your very first research question for the past three years of trying to do it? But I'm just out of curiosity wanting to know how you get your first research question. Because once you have the first one, it's a start for the men more. That's just out of curiosity. And uh, second, how are you getting yourself funded? <laughs> So, trying to identify a research question, you can start with, I've got a hunch about something, and I think if we do X, Y, and Z, then this might happen. So it may come from an intuitive knowing of the environment that you're working in or have worked in, and you think to yourself, you know, I need to know a little bit more about this, and then you start working up your question. It can be from reading someone else's work and going, oh my goodness, that's exactly what I want to do. And 
And sometimes your first piece of research can actually just literally mimic what someone else has done to build your confidence to get you going. And then, of course, there's the other where you literally have a free fall and think about what is realistic. What can we achieve in the time frame we've got, in the context we're working? So sometimes you have to open up and say, what do people want to do? And choose what are your quick wins, what are your longer term projects? And some research, some of the best research that I've been involved in has taken 10 years to get off the ground. So it's a slow process. Good research is not quick. Oh, what's the second bit? Funding. <laughs> Again, a bit like I was saying, you need to find a funder who is sympathetic and interested in the area that you're looking at. Get to know those funders, get to see what sort of funding that they have previously looked at. Get a good team around you of people that bring different skills to yours so that you've got a very strong team. And it's, I think it's like 1 in 15 bids are successful. Even of highly successful research teams, they are still churning out the bids and don't always get every hit.